Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the Launch School Podcast. My name is Callie, and I'm recording this at the beginning of week five of Capstone, literally the Sunday before week five of Capstone. Capstone is like, it's like drinking from a fire hose, but it's also just really fun. I don't know how those two things can be true, but but they are. A Capstone grad named Catherine told me to just have fun in Capstone, and that's actually some of the best advice I've been given about Capstone. I've been looking forward to recording and publishing this episode for a long time because this episode is an interview with the one, the only, Surgeon. Now, you may have seen Surgeon's name around Launch School in several different places. He's a TA here, and he has a lot of different responsibilities. So you may have seen his name on Slack when he answers a question. You may have had one of your live assessments with him where he judges you silently or a written assessment where he gives you lots of feedback, or when he tells you how to organize your functions and methods differently on a code review. My first interaction with Surgeon that I remember is he conducted my RB109 interview assessment, and I was terrified. <laughs> but it turns out that he's actually a really nice guy, and he has really great stories to share. So without further ado, here is Surgeon. Well, thanks for being here with me, Surgeon. Appreciate your time. Thanks for having me, Kali. So first things first, this is the most pressing question that um, I've been asked several times in several contexts. Mm, I'm nervous. How do you say your name? For, for us non-Serbians, how do we, how do we oh, say well, your name properly? Well, I think we came to into agreement that you know how to pronounce my name better than I do. So. Well, I would say I say it now and you're like, yes, you're saying it correctly, <laughs> which feels like a really high award, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. So how to break it down. So it would be like, sir... From from either Sir, like Sir, I don't know, Jamie Lannister or something like that, or Surgeon. Mm -hmm. And then you add John. And John is like, you know the movie, Tarantino movie, Django? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that first part. And then you just have to combine those. It's really simple. <laughs> surgeon. It's, it's, it, yeah. Surgeon. Yeah. So it's not surgeon, like brain surgeon. No, not, not like brain <laughs> surgeon. Yeah. And it's not Sir John, like you've been knighted by somebody. Well... I would like to be knighted, yeah, but yeah, it's it's not. Sadly, that's not part of your name yet. Yeah, One sadly. Day. <laughs> One day. Thank you. Appreciate that. So to give people kind of a lay of the land of what we're going to talk about, we're going to talk a little bit about so Jen's life before launch school, if he had one, we'll find out, and then studying at launch school and then working at launch school. Because you're actually a student at launch school, weren't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know, four and a half years ago, I think I started. It was a long time ago. Yeah. And fun fact, if people want to go searching in the old forum posts, you can find Surgeon's questions. When he Please don't do that. Please don't. <laughs> you have to find them now. Like, if you think you're a beginner, I was worse. Way worse. I think Chris had to reach out to me and say, you know, sometimes you have to use Google for some things. <laughs> <laughs> the forum post isn't always the answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like spamming like crazy. So I've seen there in Slack, we have the, what is it called? Gratuitous pet photos mm -hmm. channel. So we've seen that you have some adorable cats. Can you tell us about your cats? Mm, okay. Yeah, I have two actually. Two beasts. I don't know if they're adorable. They're adorable in pictures. Anyway, I have a female cat. She's four and a half years old, I think. Mm -hmm. I got her in 2017. So right at the time I started lunch school. So yeah, it was over four years ago. And I have a male cat. He's younger. He is three, three years old, maybe three years, half months, and six months, something like that. They're cats from streets, right? So I'm not exactly sure when they were born, but I think it's something like that, like four and a half and three and a half years old. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they are really nice when they let me sleep. How do they interrupt your sleep? Yeah. How? Yeah. Ooh. See, I don't have cats, you, so I don't, I don't know these cats. You, you don't have cats, yeah. So you don't know the tactics. Okay, so <laughs> usually cats are on their own, right? They don't like to do things together, maybe, you know, play a bit. But when they are waking me up, they're doing it, you know, together. They're really bonded there. They start to chase each other. They jump all over me at 3.30 a.m. <laughs> uh, sometimes the male cat... His name is Pepe, by the way, uh, like Pepe Le Pew. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you know the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. The cartoon. Is, yeah, cartoon, yeah. And he comes and he takes his paw on my cheek and he, like, kicks it, like, a few times. He's gentle, you know, but he does wake, wake me up. Like... Yeah, he's trying to wake me up. He's like, what are you doing? It's 4 a.m. Let's play, you know. <laughs> 
And also he, I, I think he has OCD, unfortunately. He, you know, like the cats like to uh, scratch the litter box with their paws sometimes. And they do it like for five seconds. That's, that's fine. After they do whatever they have to do. My male cat, Pepe, he does it for like five minutes, like crazy. <laughs> I, I mean, sometimes I wake up and I'm like, man, I would bury a body, you know, in five minutes. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> and he's like, still, you know, shh, 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 shh. Yeah, so, yeah, they're pretty much doing that. Pepe, the one who also, you know, so I've done Capstone with you a little bit. Is Pepe the one who's also like on your tablet and won't let you use your computer at certain no. times? Uh, well, they're both sometimes on my tablet, but I think you've seen the female one. She's black and white. And yeah, the one that I took picture of, that's mm-hmm. the female one. She was on my tablet. And the male one, well, yeah, he sometimes sits on my tablet. Sometimes he sits on me. Usually when I want to sleep, he's like right next to me or on top of me or mm-hmm. on top of my head. Yeah. <laughs> All your normal places, I guess. Oh, well, they're very, well, they, they look very cute. I didn't know they were so destructive, but I'm glad that. <laughs> they're cute. You know, cats sleep a lot, really. Cats sleep mm-hmm. like 15, 16 hours a day, you know, but during the day, that's unfortunate. When thing. you're awake. Like, during right. the day, when you're awake, they're sleeping. My female cat is funny. She likes to sleep in my socks drawer. So she opens the drawer by mm-hmm. herself. She goes in and she sleeps, you know, for a few hours, then comes out and then I close the drawer and that's fine. Yeah. And uh, the male one, he likes to sleep next to me. But that's only at, I don't know, 6 a.m., 7 a.m. when he actually wants to sleep because it's, you know, it's sun outside and why would you do something else? You want to sleep. Right? <laughs> yeah, but around 2, 3 a.m., not every night, fortunately, but sometimes they're, they're crazy. So before, so you said you got them about the time you started Capstone or you got the, the oldest one around that time. You said that, right? Mm, no, not Capstone. I'm oh, sorry, Core. Was, core. Yeah, core. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Um, so before you did... Core before you did launch school, what did you do? Was it tech related in any way? Very much tech related, yeah. No, I'm joking. I was a professional <laughs> poker player. Uh, it sounds funny when I say it now. So for I believe five or six years before I started uh, programming, I started learning to program. I think it was in 2011, and step by step. I became a professional poker player. Yeah. So, and when I say to people, uh, they were like, you know, you can't be a professional poker player. What this looks <laughs> That's like. That's not a know? job. <laughs> yeah. And when I say to them, oh, but I also was teaching other people to play poker. They're like, really? You were scamming people? I'm like, no, I was actually <laughs> teaching them. You know, they're now earning money and nobody believes me. They're like, no, no, you were scamming them. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know who, whoever would take, you know, uh, lessons in poker right i was gonna say so i mean i know what the game of poker is of course but what what is what does it look like when you're a professional poker player like what does your day-to-day life look like Oof. how the day-to-day life of professional poker player looks? so it really evolved so when i was when i started mm-hmm. i started with 50 dollars, and i didn't know anything pretty much the same thing when i started programming <laughs> and i wanted to teach myself you know I use Google, right? Everything is on Google. So I I was like, you know, can you learn to play Texas Hold'em? And Google would say, yes, you can. So I was like, (laughs) okay, awesome. Google is supporting me. So I started, you know, with $50. And I I made one tiny mistake. You know, I I first started playing and then started learning, right? So I I did it in reverse, right? So I lost the $50 in two days. It's it's an easy task, really. Trust me. (laughs) When you don't know anything. So then... I decided to do it in reverse. I actually bought a book about poker, started, you know, reading it, and then deposited another $50. $50, And those were last, that was last money that I actually deposited online. Those $50 was the last money I deposited online. Uh, From then on, I was only, you know, taking money. It was small, small amount of money in the first six months. You asked me how it was day to day. It was really, really challenging because, I don't know, my parents, they're both, they both finished college. My Mm -hmm. father is actually professor or was professor on, he was civil engineering professor in one of the colleges in Serbia. You can imagine how they felt when they heard their son is starting to learn to play poker. Uh, Not fun, really not fun. (laughs) 
And then I would go to my friends, right? And, you know, friends will support you, right? Why not? Yeah, so I started talking. You know, I started playing poker and I want to learn money. They was like, you're going to become a gambler. You know, I have a friend, you know, he became a gambler. Then he became an addict. Then he, I was like, no, I'm not I'm not the gambling. I don't have a gambling personality. It proved to be that way. I, I really, I knew myself. I know that I, I just don't have that. Mm-hmm. But nobody believed me, right? So constantly, day to day, I was... I was hearing, you know, you can't do that. This is awful. You will never earn money. You will lose everything. You will lose house. You will lose our house. You will lose the second house, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that was first six, seven, eight months. It became better when I started teaching. Mm. I started teaching poker because then uh, my father would sometimes come outside of my room. Right, my, I had my doors closed and he would listen. I didn't know. And later he told me, you know, I, I listen to you teach others. I have no idea what you're saying, right? But it sounds really, really great. Like, it sounds like you really know how to do this. So he was proud, and then they stopped bugging me and started earning quite a bit of money. So that was that was good as well. But later, right, when I didn't have that problem, uh, poker is extremely stressful job. Extremely. I, I mean, I can't compare it to anything. Like, comparing to regular jobs, mm-hmm. whatever, IT, you know, economics or... I don't think there is anything that you can compare it with. Yeah. I'm not comparing, of course, if you're a soldier or something like that. Yeah, of course, that's <laughs> <Right>. more stressful. <laughs> but, you know, when I'm talking about normal jobs, nothing beats poker because you can win and lose hundreds, uh, thousands of dollars in a span of 30 seconds. And that's such a high, you know, you're happy and then you get crashed. Mm-hmm. So it, it's it's really bad. I, I remember I was kicking my uh, table. I was destroying my mouth. Uh, I mean, I don't remember ever being so so nervous than when I was playing poker. So when someone asked me, you know, why don't you play poker? I stopped playing poker when I started learning programming. Mm-hmm. And I never played single hand from then. Like, Never. I didn't even deposit. And they asked me, how you don't miss it? Like, yeah, I miss the money. Right? The money was good. But mm-hmm. playing the poker, like I would play it for fun with friends. In, you know, like you playing $10, right? That's that's fine. It's for, for fun. But I would never, ever play to earn money and to live with it. Like that's so stressful that, you know, I don't recommend it to anyone. Mm. And if you are not... I guess it's less stressful if you are gambling because then you have some adrenaline and it's better, but then you can't be that good, right? Mm. Because you let your emotions decide and not, you know, your your mind. So uh, that, that's a problem, right? So I, I don't recommend it. My friends asked me, you know, teach me, teach me. I was like, no, no, no way. <laughs> find a different coach. <laughs> yeah, yeah, find a different coach. Later, of course, when I started earning a lot of money, at first they were like, "Yeah, you're going to just become a gambler addict and everything else." Everything <laughs> else will be gone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're going to end up in on street. Yeah. <laughs> did you? I guess did you discover programming, and then you're like, "Oh, I guess I should leave poker," or was it like, "I'm going to leave poker. Let me just find something else to do." Which kind yeah, of came the, first? Yeah, the latter. Yeah, oh, it okay. was like that. I didn't have any idea that I would become a programmer. Really, mm. I was like. By the end of 2016, so the poker started, a, a lot of things influenced it, but there were um, poker rooms started banning certain countries because each country has its own regulation. For example, UK on regulation, uh, Australia, the same, USA, the same. So they can't play with outside people. So I can't mm-hmm. play against uh, people from from United States. I can't play from people from Australia. There is no point me playing against people from Serbia because pe- people in Serbia don't have money. So you realize what what's the problem, right? I can't play against people who actually do have money. I need to play against people that don't. So that was one problem. The second problem is people started creating bots. Uh, oh. Bots weren't a thing, I mean, like 10 years ago maybe, but four or five years ago, bots started becoming a thing. They were bad. So not good bots, but still they were much, much better than, you know, ordinary bad poker player. Yeah. Who actually think they're really, really good, but unlucky. 
So those are the best, right? And, you know, bots are not like that. They're just, you know, the program is not good, but they still know how to play. They know the rules. They don't make silly mistakes. You know, mm. they just make programming mistakes. And you still have some fee to pay to the room. So that's why you can't really win, win too much money against them. So that was an issue. And I started noticing that this won't last forever. I always knew that it won't last forever, but I have a sense that it's, you know, approaching sort of like a down downhill. And I decided to change my career. So, yeah. But then I went to Google, of course. You know, who knows everything? Google knows. The answer of all questions. The answer of all questions. But please don't Google anything, you know, health related. Uh, it's <laughs> it's terrible. Yeah. But for, for this thing, it actually helped me. So I was like, okay, what can I do now when I finish poker? So I was like, former poker players, what do they do now? Hmm. And I ask questions on forums, on different forums, like what, what do people do? And they tell me, okay, you'll, you'll certainly be good in, at Forex trading. I was like, okay, that sounds fine, but it's also stressful. So trading at Forex is really, really stressful. I was like, oh, no way I'm trading one stressful job for, for another. And also it's not stable, really. Hmm. I, it's not the stable income. And I wanted something stable. I was trying to make, and I did have stable income in poker. It was pretty stable. It was different month to month. But like I said, I didn't have negative month in five years or six years I was playing. Right. So that that's that was good. That was stable. But still, I couldn't be sure that it will continue for, mm-hmm. you know, in the future. So I thought, okay, Forex trading, no. Uh, then I found an article of one of the former poker players who actually started learning to program. I was like, okay, programming sounds fun. I was always good at, with math in school, and I knew statistics pretty well. And also, I did taught myself to play poker, right? So I thought, okay, if I taught myself to play poker, I can teach myself to play to learn to program. Sounds reasonable. And yeah, that's how I ended up. And well, I heard also people talking about, you know, programmers they make good money and it's a stable job not as stressful as as poker so i said okay it seems fine now i just need to find someone to teach me that or some material i need to find some material mm-hmm. to to learn how to program and that was a challenge uh, again google helped me a bit <laughs> i was looking for uh because if you don't know anything about programming i really didn't know anything like if you ask me you know string i would be like was that Repeat again, please. (laughs) Yeah, spell it to me. So I started looking for, you know, boot camps. There is a site called, I think, Course Reports or Reports, Mm -hmm. something like that. It has reviews of all different boot camps. And I was like, okay, I'm not from USA, so I can go to boot camps that are in USA. So I started searching and I wrote down all boot camps that were remote, basically, right? Because I couldn't go there and also i started looking for some free options free options were back then i think there was something called odin project it was in ruby i don't think mm-hmm. it exists anymore and there was free code camp i mm-hmm. believe and yeah i started free code camp but it was a short thing i think i started it for like 15 20 days in the meantime i discovered lunch school among other boot camps so there were a couple of boot camps but um, I say I'm I'm a different person. I'm terrible at marketing. I'm really, really terrible. Like if you'd ask me, can you please pitch something to someone? I'm like, I have no idea. I always tell the truth, right? You know, I always say, actually, I always say the bad things first, right? When they <laughs> ask me, no, is bad. is poker good? I say, no, poker is really bad. It's really stressful. And I start telling them all, all the bad things. And then I say, but you're earning a lot of money. Yeah, the money is good. Why didn't you start with that? Well, yeah, because I first want to tell you, you know, what's bad, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, at marketing, I'm terrible. And when I was looking through those boot camps, they were all telling me, like, you will learn to program in three months, in two months, in five months. It's like when you try to learn language. And Mm -hmm. I sometimes get those things when I'm in, in, in town. They tell me, you know, learn English in one month. I'm like, yeah, if I know it. So, yeah, I can learn a couple more words. Like, how can you learn English in one month? Or something like that. Learn French in, in 15 days or something like that. Mm-hmm. And when I came to lunch school, I started looking for 
or started watching every video they had mm-hmm. and started looking through the, their website. And I don't remember really which webinar was that. Chris was holding it. That, that what I do remember. And he, when he was talking, he was like, I was feeling like he's telling me, don't go to lunch school, really. It's, <laughs> it's difficult, you know. I, I don't think it's, it might not be for you, right? And <laughs> that thing really, you know, stick with me because he was not telling me, you know, join lunch school, it's going to be great. No, he said it's going to be difficult. Mm. It's mastery-based learning. You're going to learn fundamentals, which is really important. But it's going to be difficult. And you need to first finish prep. And then they talked about some test that you need to do or something to get accepted. So I thought, oh man, this is difficult, right? I want to do this. And they're not promising me anything grandiose. They promised me to learn fundamentals and I can take, you know, how many time I need. And also the price was fairly reasonable, even for someone living in Serbia. So yeah, that's how I opted to do lunch school. Yeah. Never regretted it. Really. Never So you said that you had some things going for you when you're looking into programming, like you're good at math and statistics. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So going through the core curriculum, what were things that you found even while doing program? You're like, oh yeah, this is like really comes naturally to me. And then what were things that were hard for you to do or to understand? Did I say, have you seen the questions that I asked in forums? I have, but I can't remember what they are. I mean, I, I was an idiot. I, I don't know. I didn't know anything, right? So it's it's not like everything was easy for me. Like when you when they were talking about Git, GitHub, I was like, "What's the difference?" You know, I, I have no idea. So yeah, that's the beginning was really really difficult. Hmm. Like going through the prep course, trying to figure out that when you literally don't know anything. Some people they come and you know what? I had a class in high school. I had a class in college. I was studying economics. I I didn't have anything programming related. I was just playing, you know, games on my computer. Mm-hmm. So, so that thing, that initial starting to learn programming, that was really, really challenging. I did find that solving problems was really easy. I didn't expect it to be easy, but it was. I found Code Wars. That person also, a uh, former poker player, recommended Code Wars. So I started solving problems there. And I started from 8Q, it's from 8Q, like the easiest ones, and then you get go through 1Q. They were easy, right? I could I could do them, like 8Q, 7Q, 6Q, 5Q, you know? I was solving problems, and I, I don't know how many problems I solved before I joined Lunch School, but I think it was several hundred of problems. I wow. solved actually before joining Lunch School. It, it was crazy. And I found that solving problems was sort of natural and not as challenging, but getting to to that you know place where I can actually join lunch school that was really difficult because mm-hmm. like I told you I, I didn't literally know anything about programming so those first two or three months I spent a long time in prep I think I was I found lunch school in May so maybe around the beginning of May maybe May first mm-hmm. and then I joined in August so it's like May June July so full three months in prep and. I was working full time, not working like a job. I was working on lunch school material full time. So when I finished poker, I set aside quite a bit of money to last two or three years for me Mm. to live two or three years. So I was like, okay, I'm going to devote to this full time. That's like five to six hours of studying a day. And that's a lot. Like when someone tells me it's just five hours and working eight, you know, working eight and studying five hours, that's not the same thing, right? studying it completely mentally exhausts you so mm-hmm. studying more than five hours six hours a day it's really not possible to do it efficiently so yeah remembering that that period i was working full-time on lunch school for three months before i joined mm-hmm. and solved a lot of problems and then when it, when it began like when i started the core everything felt r- relatively easy i wouldn't say some course was like, very difficult and some was easy. I pretty much, the first course was the, the toughest one. I was really hard on myself. I didn't want to take the assessment <laughs> before I felt I was really ready. And back then we didn't have a lot of study sessions. So mm-hmm. we had maybe one session a week. And the time 
of the session was not the best for me. <laughs> I had to wake up at 3 a.m. to take the session. I remember that. But I did join every study session for written and interview assessment. And yeah, it, it turned out to be great. Then the next courses were easier. So, so yeah, that sums it up, I think. Was it something else I needed to answer? I don't know. No, I, I, think, the I, think, I think you covered it. <laughs> I think you covered it. Things that were easy for you and things that were harder for you. you mm -hmm. it. So outside of the study session, so, you know, kind of now we have in Slack, there's a pretty vibrant community. Were you a part of that community? Like, did you interact with other students kind of in an informal way or were you just... I tried. Solo? I mm -hmm. tried. I don't like to do things solo. Although, you know, my girlfriend says you're like grumpy. You don't like, <laughs> you, don't, you don't like working with other people, but I do. I, <laughs> Uh, actually, when I was going through core, I was always trying to find people to work with. Mm -hmm. But it was difficult back then. Uh, we didn't have a lot of students. Now we have much more, maybe three times more. Back then, we didn't have a lot. And I was in different time zone than True. almost everyone. Right? So it was difficult to find some time to work with others. And all students go at different pace. So I had to find new students when I was going through through a different course. So but yeah, I, I did meet some students, although I do think that now it's it's much, much easier to find students to work with. And we encourage that during study sessions, you know, find other students, work with other students, do some mock interviews. It won't feel lonely going through lunch school because it can. Going through mm -hmm. lunch school can feel lonely uh, sometimes. Yeah, it's true. So then how did I guess at what point in the curriculum of core did you transition to being a TA? And I didn't. That I happened? didn't. I didn't. Yeah, yeah. Well, I was. When did you become a TA? After core. Officially. Oh, okay. After gotcha. core. Yeah, officially. So I started holding study sessions after about two, two or three months after I started core. Okay. But those were, uh, Chris told me, yes, right? It's unofficial study session, right? It's not official. It's unofficial study session. You do not get our stamp of approval. Uh, yeah. So it's, uh, I asked him, you know, can I help with something? And I was a different time zone than TA that was holding study sessions back then. I think it was Elizabeth. And I said, can I help some, you know, we had a bit more students and he has said, yeah, yeah, you can hold study sessions, but he didn't know me. Right. I had right. okay marks. But I was from Serbia, right? And, you know, I didn't have any recommendations. Nobody knew me. I was a former <laughs> poker player. That's not really... Uh, <laughs> I don't know about this guy. Yeah. Yeah. So he was like, okay, you know, you can hold study sessions, but just do it unofficially. And I was announcing them in Slack, I believe, at first. And I, well, I can only imagine that students were telling him that they like my study sessions because after a few months, maybe a month or two, he said, okay, you can hold official study sessions now. I was still not TA, but I was holding official study <laughs> sessions. Working your way uh, up. <laughs> yeah, working my way up. And I was doing that for the next couple of months until I finished the core. That was in, I believe, June, June uh, 2018. That's when I finished. So it took me a, a little bit less than a year to finish the, the core. And then one place got free and he asked me, okay, from September, do you want to become a TA? And I was like, of course. And yeah, that's how I become, became a TA. So at that time when you finished core, was Capstone a thing? It was, it was, but I'm from Serbia, right? So Capstone is not a thing here. I did think back then to, mm -hmm. to ask Chris, you know, I will pay everything, literally. <laughs> and... <laughs> Just teach me. Just, just take me. You know, I will pay everything. You know, jobs here, they're not paid as as good as capstone salaries, not even close. So I cannot mm -hmm. compete for those. However, even when I was playing poker, I really loved teaching. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I was, I was a kid, when my father asked me, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? I was like, I want to be a professor like you. And he said, Mm, well, we can't guarantee that. I mean, at his college, civil engineering, they didn't accept any new assistants for like 10 years or so. Mm -hmm. They didn't, didn't need, right? Not a lot of students. So he said, just don't think about that, becoming a professor. Think about what you like. I didn't like anything, really. I like to play games. So that's, that's not uh, <laughs> going to earn me money. So when I started teaching poker, I realized I really, really like teaching. And then when I came to launch school, 
again, I forgot about teaching. I didn't expect to be teaching. I, I wanted to just learn programming. But then when I started holding study sessions, I realized, oh, I really love to do that. I remember that I love teaching. And then when Chris asked me to become TA, I realized, well, this is sort of what I wanted from the beginning, right? I wanted mm -hmm. to be a professor. I'm not a professor here, but I'm still teaching students and I'm making a difference in their, their lives. And, and that's, that's the same thing, right? And it's just not in college. It's, yeah. it's in online. And when I started doing the job, I realized it's the best job ever for me. I remember during my time in during lunch school, my friend came and he said, oh, I might have a job for you. It's paid. I said, yeah, yeah, yeah I, d I don't want to listen really. Said, but he didn't tell you how much money. I, no, no, I have a perfect job. I loved what you, I do. I don't want to, you know, mess that up. So I, I said, I'm not listening to any offers. I don't care, right? <laughs> the most important thing for me is to do what I love and to have free time to to be with my family, with my friends, with my girlfriend, right? To spend time. Mm -hmm. And it's not everything about the work, but you, you need to love what you do, right? And I have that. So I was like, okay, I'm set, right? Until lunch school is here, I'm here. <laughs> That's awesome. So you mentioned that you love teaching. And but as a TA, you teach, I think, I don't know if people understand how much you do <laughs> as a TA. I mean, they might know like, oh, he's the... You're the disembodied voice on an assessment. <laughs> yeah, torturing how... people torturing people on assessments. Yeah, that's, that's, right. that's my primary job. Yeah. Silently judging them while petting your cat, you know, like that that whole vibe. But so you do a bunch of different stuff. I mean, you can list it if, if you'd like to, but specifically I want to know what parts of being a TA do you're like, oh, this is like my favorite part, and other parts of being a TA that might be like, well, I'll do this for the sake of the other parts that I like. <laughs> <laughs> well, when I started, right? I mean I was up for everything. I love everything, really. And I still do love everything. I mean, everything here is about teaching. I am assessing code reviews or grading them, grading assessments, holding interviews. I am working on improving the material sometimes, the school mm -hmm. material, so creating new exercises, for example. But then in 2018, was it 2018? Wait, let me think. I totally missed like, my years. It was beginning of 2019, actually. I became, I started working in Capstone. Mm -hmm. And that's a whole different story. <laughs> uh, really, really, that's that's a whole different thing, right? And right now, I think working with Capstone students is what I love the most. It's a different type of work. You know, you're working, we are working on Zoom, right? So we can see each other. It's more personal, and I realized, yeah, I really, really love that. So, so yeah, that's that's my favorite part now, working with capsule students. Not all, of course. You know, you have people like Rodney. You know, you, you can't love everyone, <laughs> but most of them. You yeah. do what you can. Do yeah, what you can with what you're given. Uh, Rodney, I hope you're listening. Um, so there's, well, let me ask you this: How many tic tac toe games do you think you've reviewed? hundreds i would say yeah so those things they well that's why we have new tas and they're mostly doing those things because after you see 50 let's say tic-tac-toe games or rock paper scissors you've pretty much seen them all so when you start you're doing those code reviews you already know what mistakes students will make mm -hmm. but it's the same when you when you're doing interviews really uh, hmm. sometimes you you can actually feel how the student would do after just a few minutes you don't know what hmm. the exact mark will be that's not possible but right. you can get a sense of where this is going after five or six minutes sometimes they surprise you which is great so that's that's the thing that i i, I mean i did almost 800 interviews i think so far it's a lot I don't know. I stopped counting after 500. I wanted to get to 500. And then later I started. <laughs> like a tally count. sheet somewhere? No, 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 no. I just counted the, the number of uh, recordings we have. And I, <laughs> I, I went through my name. And I was like, oh, I'm approaching 500. That's really good. <laughs> yeah. So when, after that, yeah, it becomes a bit repetitive. Mm -hmm. But it's still fun. You get new students, right? Every, every person is different. 
Every person has its own problems and they, they all struggle with similar things, but I don't know, in a different way. So that's, that's more interesting. Code reviews though. Yeah. They're, they're pretty much, pretty much the same thing. But yeah, working with Capstan students, whole new story. That makes sense too. Cause you, among other things, you, you teach data structures and algorithms. So your natural skill in solving problems helps you out. Yeah. That's, that's for data structure, but I also teach React and Redux. That's Does that come naturally some- to you? Not really. No. Mm. No, that that was that was not something that was natural. Although it's it's fine. When I started programming, remember I didn't know anything. I was mm. afraid that it's going to be like designing things. And mm. you know, I can't really draw anything. You you've seen my capstone students can attest to this. This is true. Yeah, yeah. I'm really terrible at drawing. Like I can you know draw a line or maybe something like that. But if I need to draw something. You know, more complex, I'm, I, I'm really terrible at it. So I was afraid, oh, if I need to design something, I'm done. Like, like mm-hmm. I, just, I just can't do that. I don't love it. I don't want to do it. And then I realized, oh, when you're a programmer, you don't have to design. You just program. You know, they give you design. They give you how it should look. And you mm-hmm. should just program it. So that's fine. So yeah, React Redux, they were a bit more challenging. But that's part of working uh, as a TA, right? You need to ramp mm-hmm. up on things and you need to pick up things quickly. It seems like I picked things pretty quickly. So so that helped. That helped. And um, I think it helped that I learned to play poker. That helped mm-hmm. because from for the last, I don't really count the period when I was in college. I really didn't like what I was learning. So you remember when you're in college, you just want to pass the test, right? You don't care about the material. Most people, I like that. I was definitely like that. So I just wanted to, you know, get the grade, passing grade, whatever that is. And when I leave, I just want to forget everything because I, <laughs> my mind should be worrying. Yeah, pass the test and you know, just forget everything else. Uh, here, I had to learn something. But when I was learning poker, I also had to learn things. And I was really interested in what I was reading Mm. and I wanted to learn it. So for maybe six years, I was teaching myself something all day. I had to improve myself so I could teach others those same things. And I was doing that for six years straight. And back then I learned that consistency is really important. You need to do it every day. You can't do it, you know, today and then after a month. You have to work on it every day. And that really helped in, in law school and in core and after when I started doing the job. You need to do something. I know first I have faith in myself because no with no one believed in me in when I was trying starting to learn poker. <laughs> uh, I I did stick with it. When I started law school. I knew, okay, I'm going to work consistently and eventually I will get it. And it ended up pretty great. And now when I'm working as a TA, also we have sometimes some difficult tasks. I need to learn something quickly. But I'm like, okay, I'm going to set aside a certain amount of time every day. And I just believe that it will work. And usually it does in the end. Hmm. I love that you already knew how to learn, but also... I think sometimes when people start launch school, they have a hard time knowing they can do it. And even if other people are like, what is launch school? That's not a real school. It's just some weird thing on the on the internet. But you've kind of already dealt with that where people are like, poker, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah, I, honestly, when I'm looking at back at it now, I'm like, mm-hmm. how the hell did you do that? Like, mm-hmm. from this perspective, I was like, where did that confidence come from? I'm not really confident. Guy. I, well, I became more confident as I grew older. When I was a kid, mm-hmm. I was really not confident, like opposite of confident, honestly. And then later, you know, I always say I was late in puberty, maybe around 26, I came into puberty or something. Mm -hmm. So later I became more and more confident. But when it came to poker, I think that's really where or when I grew up. I was Mm -hmm. like, I think I'm going to be good at it, even though nobody believes in me and just going to stick with it. And I trusted in myself so much. I really, like I said, now when I look at it, I was like, how did you do that? Even when changing the career, right? I was not young. When I changed the career, I I was 33 years old. That's not young by any book. And I was like, no, it's going to be easy, right? I just set aside, you know, money for two, three years. I'm going to learn it. I'm going to get a job. It was like, like, like that, right? Mm-hmm. Now, when I look at it, I was like, you know how many things could go wrong? And, <laughs> you know... But yeah, it, it just did work. So 
That's awesome. Having that growth mentality really, really, really helps. You know, don't have, let anyone tell you that you can't do something. Of course, mm-hmm. you can't be Michael Jordan right now. If you're 35, you want to play basketball, of course you can't. But if we set aside some physical constraints, you can do pretty much everything. You just mm-hmm. need to set aside and yeah, it will take you more time. For some people, you know, some things can come easier. They're more, ta- more talented. But, you know, practice and consistent effort beats talent. Always. You just have mm-hmm. to work on it day and night and you will learn it and if you understand that not really understand but if you start believing that just put the work maybe you don't believe it now but then after a few months you you've put consistent work of month after month you're going to see results and then those results are going to help boost your confidence a bit and then you're going to continue working on this you know i just i just say to people you know just don't give up if you want to do this, just don't don't give up. If it's difficult, okay, but you are putting time. If you're not putting time, of course, you know, it's not going to be possible. But if you're putting time, just give it six months and see where you're at. For most people, it does work out. So you mentioned a few things that don't seem to change, like different approaches to problems or code reviews. You're like, yeah, I know where this is going. <laughs> um, are there are there more abstract things that you think don't change, like mindsets or approaches to study? Kind of just when you see the student body in core that you're mm-hmm. like, I've seen this pattern before. What are things that come to mind for that? Hmm. Well, actually, it's not really a mindset. But what always amazes me uh, is the type of students that we do have in lunch school. Or at least the type of students that I see in study sessions. I don't know everyone, but I see mm-hmm. some a lot of students in study sessions. They really want to learn the material. That always mm-hmm. amazes me. Like I said, in college, I, I didn't want to learn the material. I I was forced to come to lectures because I had to. They, they t- tell you if you don't come to lectures, you're not going to get uh, signatures, so you can't pass the test, blah, blah, blah. So I was like, okay, I was expected to study sessions. People come because I have to come because I want me as the test, right? But they come and they ask questions and they're really curious about the answers that you give them. They really want to learn. Then later they're like, oh, I learned so much. Thank you. And I didn't expect that when I started working. And those things don't change. Mm. Like year after year, I do these study sessions and I always have students telling me, oh, it was great. I learned so much. Thank you. And they want to learn. That That's really good. They have the mentality. They came here to learn and they... They're glad when they're learning something. So, so that's really that that's something that really doesn't change. I think. On the flip side, with your time here, is there anything that you have noticed that has been has been changing or has changed? Hmm. Well, it did change for the better, I think. But I think students are much more connected now mm-hmm. than back then. We have Spot, which is they have student-led study sessions, and. Like I told you, I think four or five years ago when I started lunch school, it was a much lonelier experience. I mean, I could find some students, but it was not like now. It's, I mean, if now, now if you have students that you can, you know, talk to each, you can talk to each other like every few days, you can meet on Zoom, you can see each other, it becomes much more personal and it's easier to do it. Otherwise, you're on your own, right? And that, that's not, that's not fun. So I think that that involved the community involved. I, some students come to my study sessions even in one on nine and they know each other. I'm like, <laughs> how in the world do you know each other? They said, oh, we met. We were in a different study session, and then we get together and blah blah blah. So I'm like, great, you know, just work together and it everything will turn out great. So I think that's something that did change for the better, and p- students should do that. They should try to find other students. They should try to connect with other people. It's really important. It's really important because first, the experience in lunch school is going to be better because you're not doing it on your own and you're meeting different people. That can never be bad. So yeah, mm. that's, that would be my answer. Good answer. So last student-centric question. There is sometimes there's like a healthy fear and there's kind of an unhealthy fear of capstone sometimes of like this ethereal place where everyone like it's transformed into software engineers and happens behind closed doors that is magical. And sometimes people think that unless they know everything perfectly all the way through core, they're not worthy of capstone. So as somebody who teaches capstone, what, well, what are your thoughts on that? And then what makes a good capstone student? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's like 
how do you, uh, in Harry Potter we have Ho- Hogsworth, right? That's that's yeah. the place where they're yeah. learning. Yeah, no, the Capstone is definitely not like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So so let me think. For a good Capstone student, I think students, or at least I heard, students mm-hmm. are too much occupied, or they think too much about their grades. Mm-hmm. And while grades are important, they are definitely not everything. I mean, you can have A plus student, like A plus all the way student that doesn't do, do really well in Capstone. And you can have okay student, sometimes even a B, sometimes maybe one not yet, that mm-hmm. does well, right? Uh, and you wouldn't expect that. It, but Capstone is completely different. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know even how to explain it other than you in core, you've basically learned to learn something to the mastery level and you can take as many time as you like. You can take mm-hmm. three months for one on I and that's fine until you master the material. Don't take the test. Simple as that. Mm-hmm. And I always say to students, don't rush. I mean, if the money is not the issue, don't rush. If you don't feel ready, don't take the assessment. Mm-hmm. And getting one, not yet, again, it's not some terrible thing which will, you know, I'm done. I can't get into Capstone. Yes, you can. So a lot of students got one, not yet, and still are in Capstone. You can get not yet after not yet after not yet. This means that you're rushing too much and you haven't mastered the material before you started the exam. But getting mm-hmm. one occasionally, that's fine. So no, I, w- I wouldn't say grades are that important as students think. And they are, I think most students are afraid about grades, right? Because that's something they can see. Right. I have A mi- minus. Oh, damn. <laughs> capstone out of the way. No, no, it's not like that. I think to be good Capstone student, well, first you have to realize that Capstone is just in time learning. So completely different than MCOR. What this means is Monday we are... Talking about one topic on Tuesday, we go on next topic on Thursday, Wednesday, next one, Thursday, next one, Friday, next one, next week, next topic. And then after two weeks, oh, system design, completely different thing. I mean, Kelly can testify. It's, you get more homework and you never sleep ever again. <laughs> and yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty that's not much true. it. That's kind of true. <laughs> Partially true. <laughs> so basically, you have to be okay with not knowing everything Mm. and with not mastering most of those things. I don't think you will master anything pretty much in Capstone. You just don't have time to master it. If I gave you, I don't know, algorithm book and I told you, okay, master it. And you have like indefinite amount of time. I'm sure everybody will be able to do that. It's Mm -hmm. okay. It's, it's fine. But when I tell you, oh, okay, we're going to talk about, I don't know, pointer based models on Monday and Tuesday. Well, I'm not talking about Twitter page that was yesterday. Like you can't master something in a, in a day, but you need to become aware of the, that topic, right? Because that come on up on interviews. And I would say the most important things for Capstone is for students to have positive attitude. Mm-hmm. I've seen so many students that come to Capstone and they get really, really anxious when things are not going according to their plan. And their plan was that everything is going to be smooth riding. Or for most students. And f- trust me, for most students, Capstone is not smooth riding. Right? <laughs> it's not, right? It's completely different. It's, oh, damn, I didn't learn this topic well. And tomorrow it's a new topic. And what am I going to do? Well, it's fine, right? You don't have to know everything. But you do need to co- become aware of different things. But you need to keep positive attitude because... Your attitude affects other team members. You're not alone in Capstone. You're in teams of four. Right? So we currently we have six groups, four, four people in each team. So if you're negative and you're constantly negative, like, oh, I can't get this, I can't get this, this is bad, this is bad, this is bad, it affects other team members. So then they, they are affected by your negative experience and their experience in Capstone becomes worse, mm-hmm. right? So what you can do is you can have positive attitude. You can smile. You can say, okay, I didn't master this, but I did my best. If you every day you do your best, it, you just have to trust. Trust us, right? Mm-hmm. Because me and Chris are always telling you it's going to work out in the end. So just trust us that in the end it's going to work out. But 
put in the time, right? It, it doesn't mean, oh, okay, it's going to work out, then I can sit and I, I don't have to do anything, right? You have to put in the work. But if you feel like you're behind, that's fine. Someone is always behind. We have 24 students, right? 12 students are behind of the first 12 <laughs> students, let's say, you know? Someone is right. always behind. So you just have to, you know, keep positive attitude, smile, and be like, okay, everything is going to work out. And if you do that, that's 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 really good for, for Capstone. That's helpful. I think it's <laughs> that's helpful. You're saying like, yeah, yeah. okay, <laughs> yeah, I don't have to be nervous anymore. <laughs> I'm gonna go try to apply this to my life. I'll let you know if it works. I'll get back to you guys. Um, this is this is helpful, and that's. I mean, these are just self-serving questions. I'm not asking for anybody <laughs> else. It's just for my own help. Last question is. What's something that might surprise people to know about you? Mm, something that might surprise people. Well, I've been told by other Capstone students. <laughs> no, not I'm not Bond villain in Jesus. No, no, it's not that. <laughs> but I've been told that I look a lot younger than I am. I'm actually 37 years old. You do look a lot younger than that. Yeah, and people are like, really? 37? You look like 30. And I was like, yeah, but... That really didn't work for me when I was 25, you know. When I was 25, I looked like 18, like teenager. <laughs> so, yeah, looking like teenager at 25, uh-uh, bad thing. <laughs> Trust me. So, yeah, now it pays off. <laughs> so, yeah, it's whenever I'm at, like, those study sessions and someone asks me, you know, how old are you? I'm like, yeah, yeah I'm 37. They're like, what? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Some Botox and, you know, nice creams. <laughs> And you too can have these things when you were a TA at launch school. <laughs> awesome. Well, another question. So I think we can all agree that as students, when we go through the interview assessments, it's frankly terrifying. Sometimes a little bit terrifying, sometimes very terrifying. It's not terrifying for me. I don't know what you're... <laughs> <laughs> Wait, were you nervous when you took your RB109 interview? Um, actually, n- No. Uh, okay. But I think yeah. it's because of poker. Uh, it's because of poker. You know, when you go through that stressful environment, interview is like, oh, they're just you just need to talk, right? It's mm-hmm. it's fine. I although I do have to say, whenever I was talking with Chris when I was mm-hmm. in core, I was petrified. I don't know why. Because <laughs> like he didn't it wasn't the interview, more? right? He was like, oh, um, are you free next week? Uh, let's have a chat. And I was like, no, that's, oh, that's terrifying. Okay, okay. Okay. That's terrifying. Right. And I was like, yeah. Like, I was like, talk, talk about what, uh, you know, I mean, our, let's say RB 129 or 139. What does he want me to talk? And then he would, we, we would start calling and I was literally trembling, you know, the first time. I was like, what does he want to know? He would say, you know, Pete said really nice things about you and he never talks nice. I was like, really? You could have just, you know, sent me a message. I don't know. <laughs> Something less stressful. <laughs> you have to make me suffer for a week. <laughs> yeah. 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 So yeah. Talking with Chris was in the beginning, really, really stressful. Yeah. I, so yeah, I can imagine for other students, it would be the same. Well, you thing. have that effect on other people. I just want you to know that <laughs> you have that effect on some people. <laughs> So do you want to you want to keep that vibe or you want to you want to demystify? Oh, most definitely. Actually... Most okay. Definitely. <laughs> we won't go into how nice you are. We'll just say that he's really scary. And so, he's he's judging you. Because, uh, Chris told me multiple times, like you know, students come to me and Capstone students come to me and say, mm-hmm. you know, Sergio is actually really nice. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, of course he's nice. Like we didn't think he's nice. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what I think it is. I think it's just because you're quiet. I think that's really what it is. I mean, like. On assessments, because I was terrified. You did my RB109 assessment, and I was terrified of you. Because first of all, like, your camera's off, and you're just like, they're like, yeah, are you ready? Okay, I'm here. Here's the question. And I'm like, wait, does he hate me? I don't know. <laughs> uh, am I doing right? Anymore. Am I doing wrong? What, what? Yeah. No feedback. And then, I, yeah. and then I finished it. You're like, okay, good. Here's the next question. And then I finished it, and you're like, okay, your, your grade will be with you in 24 hours. Have a good day. I'm like, wait. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what's happening. <laughs> It's so terrifying. <laughs> so I think it's the mysterious quietness that's just like, who's this guy? 
He's so scary and mysterious. <laughs> <laughs> and he pets a cat while he judges us. Well, most definitely. I, yeah. I'm judging you and my cats are judging you. So you can think. <laughs> well, your cat's worse though, right? Your cat's <laughs> judging more. Yeah. Yeah. Always. <laughs> well, that's the end of my questions. So I appreciate your time and thanks for, for sharing your life with us. Much appreciated. Thank you, Kali. Thank you for inviting me. And hopefully it will, it will be interesting for other students to hear about my story. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. As a friendly reminder, this podcast is for the community. So we'd love to hear any suggestions you may have about who we should interview or what kind of questions we should ask on the Bytes episodes or any subjects that come to mind that you think we should cover. So if you have an idea, we ask that you reach out to us at hello at launchschool.com. So send us an email to hello at launchschool.com, subject line podcast. That's it for today's episode. Hope you have a wonderful rest of your day, and I hope you enjoy whatever you're studying today.